Well, we are in a different time right now in our world. Social distancing has us spending more time at home than we normally would. Uh, I'm with my wife basically all day, every day, which is awesome. I love it. I'm not complaining at all. But the uh, the 24 7 ness of being around someone can sometimes add to uh, how do you say relational tension, if you will. Being cooped up with someone can sometimes add to a little bit of relational tension. Here's a great example of this. Uh, a couple weeks ago. I was really feeling like a pizza, and I'd seen like an ad online for a Domino's pizza, and I don't usually like my wife can't eat pizza, so I don't usually go get stuff like that. I think I've ordered pizza like twice in my life since being married, at least. Uh, and so, anyways, I was just feeling like one one day, uh, and so I decided I, I'm going to order a pizza. Like I'm an adult now, I get to do that, right? That's what being an adult is. And so I order a pizza. A couple minutes later, the doorbell rings, and I'm excited. I'm getting up to go get it, and then Carrie turns to me and she goes, "Who's at our door at this time of night?" And I think to myself, oh shoot, somewhere along the line of me wanting to order a pizza and me actually ordering a pizza, I forgot to include my wife in the decision making process here. And so when I came up the stairs with a pizza in my hand, it was a pretty big surprise for Carrie at that moment. Uh, and she, you know, can't eat pizza and she's going, what's going on here? Like, I, you, like, I'm trying to eat clean and you're putting this in the house and you didn't talk to me about this. And so anyways, about five minutes later, she's still, you know, kind of yelling at me. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, I know what I need to do to make this right. So I grab my keys and then I go and I take her out for an ice cream date. Bam, back to, back to happily ever after. Uh, and uh, so anyways, no matter who you are, uh, the, this isolation is influencing us in a huge way. Whether you are married or you have kids or you're a kid yourself, this isolation period, this lockdown is having a massive impact on all of us. Some a ton, some a little, but it is influencing all of us. Uh, and we're home more. We have more time for some things, less time for other things uh, all of a sudden. And everything is just kind of like up in the air. There are a lot of things in our life that have just kind of stopped. I don't know if you've seen some of those old uh, clips from those old movies where the waiter, he's holding a plate of stuff and then he just hits this bump and, and he just like falls and everything just goes flying up in the air, right? And then he's got to like, and he's got to catch it all as it comes down. That's kind of like our life right now. We had this plate with our life and all our things were organized and, and, and all of a sudden we hit this COVID speed bump and, and now we're in this limbo period where everything is kind of up in the air and we're like looking at all these things and waiting for it to come fall back down onto our plate. And we're in this like waiting period right now. That's kind of what our lives look like. And although... That's really difficult. Although we're in a, in a challenging place, there's also huge opportunity that comes along with that. Right? There's this, there's this opportunity because so many things are up in the air. There's this opportunity for us to rearrange and reprioritize and reset things like our work schedules or our eating and our physical health or our family time or our sleep schedules. Praise Jesus. Uh, but there's also things like our opportunities our priorities, things like our mental and spiritual health. There's the opportunity to reset things like how much time we spend with God or how we spend time with God. And so right now we are starting a new series and we're calling it Reset because we are in this golden opportunity right now, something that we haven't had maybe ever in our lives to reset so many things that are like up in limbo that we're waiting to see how they come down. And so what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks is looking at some of these I am statements that Jesus made. And these statements are basically key moments where God reveals important characteristics of himself in scripture. And so what we want to do do over this series is to uh, get a better understanding of who God is. And in light of that, have a better understanding of who we are. And so our goal is that as we go through the series, when things come back down and land on our plate, when we get back to normal life, that we would be able to prioritize and reset how we do things in light of the truth of who God is and who we are, and that our priorities would go along with that. So this week, we're going to be looking at John 6, we're looking at where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there right now. Uh, if you forgot your Bible at home, uh, oh shoot, that excuse doesn't work anymore. So you can get off your couch, go grab your Bible right now. Uh, I'm going to just quickly take us through a little bit of context of what's going on in this moment uh, before we get to verse 25, which is where we're going to pick up and read. So up until this point, 
Jesus has been going around from place to place, teaching. He's starting to gather crowds. People are starting to get interested in what he has to say, and he's performing these miracles. And all of a sudden, there's a bit of excitement coming around Jesus. There's, there's, these crowds are getting bigger. These miracles are impressive. And these Jews who are following all this that's happening, they're getting a little bit excited about all this. And we see in verse 15 that they actually wanted to make Jesus king. See, they were pumped about what was going on because Jesus was starting to look like this really significant figure that they could make king and help them overthrow the Romans and rebuild their Jewish kingdom and get back to their nation state. And they were pumped about that because they've been working towards this for a long time. So they're like, oh, this dude's like the chosen one. Like maybe he's a prophet. They're not really sure. But obviously he's doing miracles. He's doing all these cool things. And so they were getting excited about him. And so the day before our story takes place, Jesus is on one side of the lake and he's feeding uh, the 5,000, right? And so there's just like three pieces of bread and like two little sardines and he blesses it. It's a miracle and he feeds 5,000 uh, plus people. They have like buckets and buckets of food left over. It's amazing. And then later that night, it's getting late. Jesus sends the disciples over to the other side of the lake on the boat. And it's the only boat that they have. And then he's hanging out and it gets dark and uh, everyone's kind of going to bed. And then he goes, well, I don't have a boat. And so he goes across to meet up with the disciples, but he walks on the water to get to them. And no one sees because it's late at night. He meets up them and there's, you know, the storm and all that stuff going on. Anyways, he gets there. They get to the other side. The next morning, the crowd wakes up. And they're looking around and they're like, well, we're, they're just here for Jesus, right? There's nothing else. So anyways, they probably eat some more of the food that was left over. And then they're going, where is he? But they see boats on the other side of the lake. So they all get in their boats and they go across and there they find the disciples and Jesus. And they're thinking, well, hold on a second. The disciples went ahead in a boat before and Jesus was still here. All our boats are still here. And there's no way he could have walked around the lake to get to the other side. That would have taken days. How did Jesus get to the other side of the lake? And that's where we pick it up here in verse 25 of John 6. When they found him, that's the crowd, the Jews, as they crossed the lake, on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. And basically what Jesus is saying is that they were looking for him not because they understood his miracles to be proof that he was the son of God and that he was the Messiah who had come and that was being foretold in all the scriptures. They didn't see that. They were looking for him because they were getting something out of him. Because they had, uh, what, what does he say? Because you saw the signs that I performed, you ate the loaves and you had your fill. They, want, they were beginning to get excited about Jesus because they were wanting something out of him. They had these plans for Jesus. That's why they are pursuing him. See, they wanted more miracles and more crowds because Jesus was becoming this good option for, for what the kingdom that they wanted to build. What's really interesting here is that Jesus doesn't answer their original question. See, it would have been a really impressive answer to be like, oh, well, I walked on the water. And actually, we know just from looking at the context of some of the other stuff that that's exactly what they wanted to hear. They wanted him to be king. They wanted the miracles. They wanted bigger crowds. They were pumped about that stuff. This would have been the exact answer. Oh, there are no boats. So I just walked across the water through a storm, calmed the storm, no biggie, got to the other side. Like, that's pretty cool. But Jesus didn't answer that way. Instead, he calls them out on their motivation for following him. The Jews wanted Jesus for their own purpose. And Jesus, by refusing to reveal his miracle and instead to press on them their heart condition, he shows us that he's not interested or willing to be used uh, for the Jews' own purpose. He shows us, he draws a line in the sand. He says, no, 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 I know what you want from me and I'm not going to play that game. And that's something that we can understand by reading in context. So when you read scripture on your own at home, uh, when you're doing your own devos, I'd encourage you, don't just pull out just a little verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but instead read the whole piece because you just see more of the picture when you read the whole context of a, of a scripture. You don't have to have a theology degree to, to hear that, to see those things. You just have to ask questions. Why, wait, why didn't he answer that question? We never would have seen that if we just started at verse 25. Well, let's keep going. Verse 27, he goes on to say, Do not work for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man has given you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And Jesus basically here says, Don't spend your life 
just working to build your own temporary kingdom for yourself. Don't spend your life just working on the food that spoils, the things that when, they, when you die, they're going to mean nothing. They're going to go away. It's all vanity. He says, don't spend your life working on those things that spoil on your temporary kingdom, but instead, give your life to being a part of the eternal kingdom. Give your life to working towards the food that endures for, eternal, for eternity. So what is the food that spoils for the Jews? Well, the food that spoils for the Jews would have probably been a literal kingdom, like a political revolution to overthrow the government. Nowadays, we're a lot more individualistic, right? No one here is trying to overthrow the current government, I hope. The official position of Southridge is that we don't support that, uh, you know, but uh, we have our own kind of individualistic kingdoms. Sometimes it's financial kingdoms and security in our jobs or whatever. Sometimes it's our comfortable kingdoms where we're safe, where we're not challenged a lot, where we don't have to go outside of our little bubbles. And it looks different for all of us, but we all have the same temptation. We have the temptation to use Jesus as a supplement for the kingdom that we're trying to build, to use Jesus as a supplement for our own goals and our own purpose for our own kingdom, instead of looking to Jesus and asking, how is he calling me to be a part of his eternal kingdom? How is he calling me to look towards what he is doing and to be a part of building something that is going to last longer than when I die, that's going to last and have value and meaning after everything that's got to do with me is over? That's our temptation every day. Let's keep reading. 28, verse 28. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answers, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Quite literally, to place your faith in the one he has sent, in Jesus, to place your faith. How do we do this? How do we seek after and build and, and get this food that is eternal, that lasts forever, that doesn't spoil? And Jesus says, to place your faith that is the act. The act of working for all of this is actually found in our faith and it's our placing our faith in Jesus. And this is what makes Christianity different from all the faiths that came, like the Jewish faith that came before it or the Islamic faith or, or Sikhism or whatever it is. This is what makes Christianity different. Even from secularism and atheism, it doesn't matter what it is. You worship idols and to some degree or you are trying to follow rules or laws or traditions to make some God happy. And at the base, at the, at the root of all of that, there's slavery. There's captivity to you needing to do something in order to either be happy with yourself or to make whatever God God happy. And that's where Jesus and Christianity is such a contrast to that because Jesus came and he did the work and he offers freedom, not slavery. And I struggle with this quite a bit myself. Uh, I struggle with this because when I mess up, I feel a temptation to go and do good things to make up for the bad things that I've done. And I, I think a lot of people are in the same boat. Like, I, you know, what's the ratio for how many ice cream dates per unauthorized pizza purchases, right? Like, I'm always, I'm always thinking, my temptation was not to be like, oh, babe, I'm sorry, and to give up control and be like, do you forgive me? Like, I was, I was selfish. I wasn't thinking about you. I was inconsiderate. No, I'm like, okay, well, I need to do something to make this better. I need to make up for it. I have to, like, outweigh. I have to have a little ratio here of good things being more than the bad things that I do. And that is my temptation. And what I'm really doing in that moment is I'm taking my faith and I'm placing it in myself. More specifically, I'm taking my faith and I'm placing it in my need for approval or my, my desire to control things. A couple months ago, uh, my wife Carrie was going to try out this like keto diet, right? And so the keto diet is... Um, so it's kind of like, a, it's a temporary thing. I don't think it's what you're supposed to do it long term. But basically what you do is you only eat proteins and healthy fats. And you just cut out all carbs, all sugar, any kind of bread, anything that brings happiness, uh, joy, uh, that makes you smile, anything like that. If there's sun, you got to block out your windows. It just needs to be like this. You need to feel like a dumpster for two weeks and you just cut all the sugars and everything. And it's this terrible thing. So she goes, do you want to do it with me? And I was like, no, <laughs> but I'll support you if you want to do it. So we're three days in and the withdrawal is so bad. I'm sneaking sugar into her meals. I'm just, please, like, let's just stop doing this. Can we, can we please not do keto anymore? Uh, and the withdrawal was just so terrible. 
isolation has been tough for all of us, but some of us are getting hit extra hard right now because we're in this forced spiritual keto diet. See, some of us functionally worship comfort. You know, we, uh, it's, our, it's our yummy carbs. And, uh, and all of a sudden, we've lost our comfort because, you know, we've lost our job or, or the stock market's not doing well or we can't go out and do what we want to do. And some of us, it's approval. Some of us need approval, but we can't get that anymore because we're socially isolating and we can't go out and do all the social events that we used to do. For some of us, it's power. We don't feel like we're powerful anymore because we're not the big boss in the office. Now we got all these kids running around and they don't call you sir and their lunch breaks are too long and they don't respond when you yell at them. And all of a sudden you don't have that power that you're used to feeling anymore. And for, I think, all of us, honestly, in the West, it's control. We are on a high control sugar diet here in the West. And all of a sudden it's been taken from us. And you can't control what tomorrow's going to look like. You don't get to decide what next week or next month is going to hold anymore. And now we have this void because there are these idols that we used to worship. There are these things that we would turn to to feel good about ourselves. And now all of a sudden they've been taken away from us. And this is an amazing thing and it's challenging, but the amazing thing about that is that we are in this golden opportunity right now like never before that if we can actually identify those things and replace them with Jesus, oh man, now is a great time to do that. So I want you to ask yourself, where am I functionally placing my faith? You know, is it, is it my comfort? Is it approval, power? control? What are the things that I turn to? What are the things that make me feel good about myself? Where does my identity rise and fall on? See, when things get difficult, what do I turn to for comfort? How beautiful others think I am? How successful others think I am? How successful I really am? My kids, my home, my financial security? I found for myself, as I was going through this isolation period, I started to really dislike weekends. It's like, well, that doesn't make sense. Why do I just like, I mean, I don't usually know what day it is anyways, but I, I, I would find out what day it is because you can't trade stocks on the weekends with my app. And I hated it. I don't even trade stocks, but I would just go look at the stocks I had in the, in the, in the stock market. And at least I felt like I could sell them if I wanted to, you know? And I just felt like I had a little bit of control. I'd find myself just sitting there watching them and then the weekends would come and there'd be nothing. And I, I, would, I wouldn't like that. And I realized, oh my gosh, like I've been worshiping my financial security. And all of a sudden, that's being taken away from me. And, and all of a sudden, I'm in this situation now where there's some challenges coming up and, and I'm realizing that this is something that I worship. See, you experience freedom when you place your faith in Jesus and not yourself or in other things. You experience freedom when your self-worth and your comfort and your security rises and falls on the bedrock of Christ and not on the stock market or on your home or on your family, all those other things. When you're not captive to those things, but instead that you belong to Jesus and that's where your identity rises and falls on and he never changes, that is where you get freedom. Moving on. Verse 30. So they ask him, the crowd, this is right after he says that the work of God is to believe in the one he sent. So they say, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Now, if you remember, that morning they got up. They probably ate some food from all those buckets of leftover food. Then they got in their boats and they went over and they met Jesus. The day before they had experienced a miracle, as a matter of fact, at the time of asking this question, they probably had the food from that very miracle in their stomach still. And they're going, what sign are you going to give? And so I read this and I'm like, those silly Jews. Like, didn't they see that there was a miracle the day before? Like, like how quickly do they forget? And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, how many times has God been faithful in my life? How many times has God proven his faithfulness over the entire span of history? Yet when I go through a valley or a time of darkness and I feel abandoned and I feel like God has forsaken me, man, I just like that crowd, I forget. I forget what God has done. And I cry out to him, God, why are you doing this? Show me a sign, show me that you're real, show me that you're in control. And just like that crowd, 
man, I got stuff. I got the faithfulness of him still resting on me and I'm looking at him going, what's next? Like, I, I can't trust you. I've forgotten already what's happened before. When I started... Um, a business. Uh, things were kind of going pretty well. And so I, uh, I met with some other entrepreneurs uh, to, to get some advice about, you know, how do I do this and what do I can expect and how to be wise about all this stuff. And one of them said something to me. He said, you know, right now you're really pumped up. Things are going well. You have all these things affirming this decision for you to kind of start up the side gig. Uh, he says, you should really take out, get a journal and start to write down all of these things that are affirming you, that are, that are showing you that this is the right path. He says, write all this down because the life of an entrepreneur is just up and down. And one day you're so psyched and it's the best day. And then the very next day you're down in the gutters and you're like, oh my gosh, why am I doing what I'm doing? I should quit my job. No one would ever spend money on me. You have imposter syndrome. And it's just this total roller coaster. And he says, you need to remember so that when you're in those times of those valleys and you think this is a giant mistake and you forget all those times, that you can actually remind your heart of what you knew to be true before you went down into that, that dump, when before you went down into that valley and you started to feel bad about stuff. So all you're doing is you're just this intellectual exercise to overcome your heart emotionally deceiving you. And if you'll let me, I'd like to be your journal for just five seconds because some of you guys are in this massive valley right now. Some of you guys don't see light at the end of the tunnel. Man, you just entered the tunnel. It's going to be a long ride. It's cold. You are scared. You feel forsaken. You feel alone. You, the walls are closing in and you don't know how you're going to make stuff work. And I just want to remind you right now, I want to be your journal, remind you that God, the same God who walked on the water and who fed the 5,000, that's the same God who knows what you are going through right now who has heard your prayers, who loves you, who cares for you, who deeply wants the best for you, and who is in control of everything. And more than that, you don't actually have to do that alone because the church is here. We are a community of people. We want to walk with you every step of the way. And so if you are here today and you feel like you are just in a valley and there are things just collapsing all over you, I want to encourage you to go to our website right now. If you're listening live, to go to our website, southridgefellowship.ca, and at the bottom corner is going to be a chat feature. And there's going to be somebody who's online right now who wants to pray with you privately and who wants to help you get connected to a community of people who will walk every step of the way with you. Verse 31 They go on to say, Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell it to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And here we land on the truth that Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. And see, what's happening here is they wanted more bread from him. Right? They talk about, well, God's provided for us. God's taking care of us. The manna and history and all these things. And then he says, I will give you a bread that you'll never need more. And they say, oh, give us more bread. We want more things from you. Yes, give us more of this. And he goes, no, 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 no. I'm not here to give you more bread. I am the bread. And in our life, sometimes we go up to Jesus and we say, we love, we pray and we have this laundry list of things that we want, you know, help me with this and pray for safety, keep my kids safe, you know, uh, pray for my wife, blah, blah. And we have this list of things that we want from Jesus and, and all these, and, and he comes and he says, no, 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 I'm not here to produce things for you. I am the product. I am the bread of life. See, our faith our life isn't just about what we can get from Jesus. It's actually about our relationship with Jesus. It's Jesus plus nothing else. And there's this whole temptation for us to make it, you know, Jesus plus our church attendance and Jesus plus, you know, my financial security and Jesus plus my marriage and my kids or whatever. And the temptation for us is constant tug of war in our hearts, in our, in our faith, is to make it just about Jesus. Not about Jesus plus something else. 
At the end of the day, he is all that our souls need. And when we turn to him, we will never go hungry. Verse 36 is, is interesting. They say, or he says, sorry, but as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. I'm just gonna pause really quickly there. What's interesting here, that you have seen me and you still not believe. God came down, put on flesh, stood in front of them, physically stood in front of them, did miracles, raised people from the dead, walked on water, you know, fed thousands of people, all of these things. And these Jews were so focused, these crowds were so focused on the problem that they had at hand, the Romans and overthrowing and the revolution and all of these things. They were so focused on the kingdom that they were trying to build that they missed God standing right in front of them, committing the greatest act of kingdom building that history will ever see. 37. All those that, this is Jesus still talking, all those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those who he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. And finally, verse 41, at this the Jews there began to grumble. And now they're unhappy because he said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. And this here, verse 41, at this they began to grumble and became unhappy. This is the moment in the conversation where Jesus stops becoming useful to them. This is the moment where they realize that they are not going to get what they want out of Jesus. Because all of a sudden, he's being blasphemous and he's claiming to be God and he's coming down from heaven and the father now, oh, they're seeing that this is, he thinks he's the son of God. And they go, well, we can't put this guy in charge. He's a lunatic. He's blasphemous. He's claiming to be God. And now they're going, oh man, we thought he was going to be the leader and now he's not what we thought he was. Now he's not as useful for our own personal lives. And now all of a sudden they're not interested in him. And this is a watershed moment in Jesus's ministry. And I think... This is a watershed moment for us as well. This is the moment that divides and reveals who his true followers are and who the crowd is. See, do we find offense in Jesus and reject him when the will of his kingdom and the will for our lives is different than what we want for ourselves? When Jesus stops just suiting our own personal needs and instead take says, no, 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 we're going this way. Do we reject him? Do we find that offensive? Do we, do we not obey him? And that is the watershed moment here. When he calls us to give up things that we don't want to give up, when he calls us to sacrifice or to trust in him and act in faith in a way that makes us uncomfortable, or, or maybe we think we're not going to be having the same approval as we used to if we say that thing or if we do that or if we invite them to church or whatever it is, is in that moment, do we do that or do we stick with what's safe? Do we stick with our own kingdom? And instead of chasing after what Jesus is calling us to, do we just stick with what we want? It's easy to become a Christian here in the West. To, be, to be a, become a Christian, to become a Christian here in the West, it's not difficult. Like, your family doesn't turn on you. Uh, I mean, they don't, like, go report you to the government who then comes and takes your home. You don't lose your job or your livelihood. Your cousins don't come try to kill you. It's not difficult to become a Christian here in the Western world, but it is difficult to become a follower of Jesus, to become a true disciple, because Jesus will challenge you Jesus will challenge you to give up the things that you turn to for comfort. Jesus will challenge you to give up the things that you're locked in and held captive by for your approval or for power or the things that you, were, you turn to for your control. See, following Jesus is having enough faith to follow Jesus and to do what he wants for your life even when it costs you. Even when it means doing something that you don't want to do and that is what separates the crowd from the true disciples of Jesus. See, if you worship a God who never challenges you, then uh, you don't worship the God of the Bible. You worship yourself. 
Carrie uh, and I have been going through some some pretty big changes uh, professionally in our life. Uh, we've made some uh, some significant moves that have changed the trajectory of our life, and we've ha- made some commitments that have us on the hook in some financial ways. Uh, and we're pretty excited about all that stuff, and, and we were really pumped about this new direction, uh, mostly for her career, not for myself, uh, that, that is coming out. Uh, and then all of a sudden, this coronavirus thing happened, and everything went on lockdown, and everything just got paused. And in that moment of just this huge amount of change, the ramifications for us were huge. Ma- like um, massive amounts of loss and challenge. And we're just in this like standstill period. And there's so many things. This is like, oh my gosh, this is like the worst time we could have ever done this. And I found that out of all this change, I grew incredibly scared. I had this massive amount of fear and anxiety. I was having trouble sleeping. I was more irritable and annoying to be around than I usually am. Uh, and, and out of all this change came this massive amount of fear that was controlling me. And I remember this moment that I just had this reset. And it, it was interesting. I was on the phone and I just remember this moment that I just said out loud over the phone. I said, you know what? My relationship with God is not tied to the ups and downs of the stock market. And I kind of knew that to be true, but, but when I said it out loud over myself and just like, and just proclaimed and just reset and just reminded myself, you know what? Actually, my faith, it, my, my relationship with God, my security, it's not based on those things. Actually, it's based on Jesus. And in that moment, it was like a weight was just lifted off of me. And I just felt like this peace that I couldn't explain. And then as the days kind of kept going on, all of a sudden I started to see more opportunities kind of popping up than what I was used to. And I was like, wait a minute, like this is all going, oh, like that's happening. Oh my gosh, wait, I never thought about it, but because of this, this is going to happen. And all these things that, that were true, you know, five days ago, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, they were true then, but I never saw them then. But all of a sudden, now that my mindset had changed and I wasn't scared and I wasn't fixated on all these problems, all of a sudden, all these things popped up. Now I still have the same problems going on. I still have the same challenges that I'm facing. But this, this mindset change where I, I went from fear to faith and then just this peace. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, there's opportunity. And that's bringing like all of this like excitement now. And now I'm actually like, you know what? Maybe this was like maybe a pretty good time to actually start making all these changes. And, and you know, if we time this right, this could work out really well. And now all of a sudden I'm seeing all these things come together that I didn't see before. Now right now there's a lot of change going on in our world especially here in the West, but all over the world. And that can make us scared. But I actually think there's cause for us to be excited. In a recent article uh, that was just put out, 49% of the churches that were interviewed self-reported that they were growing during this time of of this COVID-19 crisis. That is in comparison to 12% of them that reported growing last year. We went from 12% church growth in the West to 49%, and it took a crisis, which is kind of interesting. The Bible app right now has the most downloads and active users that it has ever had before in the entire history of the Bible app. And the Google searches for local churches, online church, answers for coronavirus in the Bible, and God and anxiety are just skyrocketing right now over Google. We are standing in one of the most opportunity-rich moments that we have ever experienced in our lifetime, and nobody alive right now has ever experienced something like this, and we are all on the same page. We are all looking at the same thing, having the same concerns, having the same worries, and experiencing the same things collectively as a group, and people are looking for answers. And when we are uh, transformed out of our fear mindset, and when we remind ourselves and reset on faith, reset on the fact, you know what, Jesus is not about what you give. It's not about the bread you produce, but actually you are the bread. You are enough. You are all I need. And when we rest our foundation on that and the peace of God transcends our understanding, when that happens, all of a sudden we start to see opportunities. And all of a sudden in your life, there are opportunities for you to show people the Jesus who trades out your fear and your anxiety for faith and for peace. And I want to encourage you as you go about your daily lives to to root your faith on Jesus and to show the people in your circle of influence that there's a God out there who will take away your anxiety, your captivity, your fear, and will replace it with peace, with faith, with confidence, and with hope. 
So as I end here today, I have three questions for you guys that I want to ask. Now, if you have a spouse beside you, you can uh, you can do that. Or uh, if you know you have if you're in a community group, this would be a great time for you guys to debrief those afterwards. But here are the three questions. The first thing I'm going to think about what your calendar looks like right now. Take take what a regular week in the crisis looks like for you right now, and compare that to three months ago. What did a regular week look like then? And I want you to ask yourself. This is the first question. What would it look like? Or what, sorry, what do I want my calendar to look like when I get back to my normal life? You know, in light, of, in light of who God is, in light of the fact that if I base my faith on Him and if I, don't, if I turn from my idols and I actually root myself on Him and that He brings me peace, in light of all of those things, in light of the truth of who Jesus says He is, what do I want my calendar to look like when I get back to this? Do I want to spend less time running around with the kids and trying to get every event in? Do I want to spend less time doing something or more time doing something else? The second question to think about is what is God calling me to reset in my life? And I think for myself, uh, it's how I pray and how I do devos. Because right now, when I pray, it's a laundry list of things that I want from God, you know? Uh, and, and I have all these lists of things. I have all these products that, I, that I'm, you know, counting on Jesus to produce for me. But I don't spend a lot of time just sitting with him and going, you know what, God, thank you for who you are. I don't spend time reading the Bible as much as I should, at least. I just go, man, I just want to learn more about you. I just want to know you more because you are actually the object of my faith. So what is the thing that God is calling me to reset in my life? And the final question is to think about your mindset. Am I in a, in a fear, in that change and fear mindset? Am I controlled by anxiety? Or am I in a faith and peace mindset? Do I have the peace of God over the situation that I'm in right now? Or am I in that opportunity and excitement mindset? And I want to encourage you to start with the fact that Jesus is enough, that Jesus is in control, and to root yourself in that and to find peace in Him. Because when you do that, you will start to see opportunities to start to become a part of God's kingdom, to move from fear into faith and into actual excitement over what is coming out of all of the things. And yes, it's still difficult, and I'm not trying to minimize the pain and the hardship, but there's actually opportunities in that for us to show people Jesus, for us to actually not work just for the bread that fades away and that doesn't last, but to actually be a part of working towards the food that lasts forever, to work towards being a part of the kingdom and building that kingdom of God that lasts forever. And that is exciting. Let me pray for you now as we close. Jesus, I pray that you would be working in our hearts. I pray for the ones of us that are uh, experiencing an incredible amount of fear and anxiety right now, and who feel like they're abandoned, who feel like they have been um, forsaken, God who feel like there's no light at the end of their tunnel. Lord, I pray that you would remind them that your peace would come to them and that it would transcend their understanding and that they would know that you are in control, that you know what's going on, that you hear their prayers and their cries. God, I pray for all of us as we follow Jesus, as we follow you the best we can. I pray that you would show us the opportunities in our midst of how we can be a part of your kingdom. I pray that you would convict us of the things that we turn to that are not you, that you would set us free from that so that we wouldn't be controlled by those things, but instead that we'd be rooted and founded in a life of following you and being a part of what you're doing and that they would have excitement in all of that. I pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.